Welcome everyone to Seed Sowing 101. Um, I'm Anna Fielkoff and uh, we will get started just now. Um, it's five o'clock and we have a lot of things to talk about tonight. Um, I'm Anna Fielkoff and I'm the program manager for Wild Seed Project. And tonight, Heather McCargo, our founder and seed program manager is going to talk to you about um, just the basics of seed sowing um, and give you a little online tutorial. So if you don't know much about Wild Seed Project, we are a small nonprofit located in Southern Maine. And we actually do a lot of different things besides just selling native seeds and promoting um, the growing of native seeds. We have lots of educational programming online and in person. We have a very information rich website with beautiful images and just packed full of how to resources. We also have an initiative, initiative called the Pledge to Rewild, where we encourage people to take the pledge and show their commitment to um, restoring native plants to their landscapes, whether they be in rural, suburban, or um, urban areas. Um, and then we also have um, annual publications that we put out. Um, recently, we've been putting out um, guides, and we have actually a really lovely native tree guide that um, talks about 31 species of native trees and how you can use them in the landscape and what their wildlife value is. Um, so just to tell, you know, wanted to give you a rundown of a little bit about what we do as Wild Seed Project. Um, now I'm going to pass it on to Heather as she sets up for the tutorial. Um, let me just switch over and stop sharing my screen. Spotlight Heather. And then we have our seed cam. So Heather, take it away. Hey, welcome everybody. I'm thrilled that you're all here. And this is the perfect time of year to sow native seeds. And today it was, couldn't have been more cold and raw and dark. And we had our first dusting of snow in Maine, um, which is great weather to think about sowing the seeds. And the reason the native seeds need to be sown in the late fall or early winter is they are from a Northern temperate climate. So the seed have evolved, you know, many of the species need to go through a winter cold period before the seeds will germinate. So what I'm gonna do is walk you through what the ingredients that you are you need and the process, and then we'll have a question and answer session at the end. So the first thing you will need is seeds. And so we, you know, one of the things we do at Wild Seed Project is we, um, we sell seeds of hand collected native wild type native seeds. You, we are in New England and there are other seed companies in other parts of the country, um, but we're a good choice if you're in the Northeast. Then the next thing you need is where you're gonna sow the seeds. And um, we recommend, let's see, I'll get that showing in the picture, sowing seeds in pots. Now you might be wondering if these are native seeds, why can't I just go take them out in my yard and throw them in some bare soil there? And the reason is, all soil, you know, two square inches of soil will have thousands of seeds in it, most of which will be probably annual weed seeds or invasive species, not probably the native seeds. And those weed seeds will all germinate and grow much faster than the native species. So I, we have found it's very successful when you sow seeds in pots and they need to be a durable pot. So a clay pot or these heavy duty plastic pots, the fiber pots aren't a good choice. They're really designed for annuals like vegetables and annual flowers so that they degrade right away. Well, you need something more durable. And then the soil I recommend people use is a good organic top, um, potting soil, which there's many brands out there that are available now. Make sure you get one that has a good amount of organic compost in it, as opposed to a more traditional potting soil, which is a sterile peat moss mixture and peat moss is, you know, a mined product and then it's sterile. And so they will typically add some sort of chemical fertilizer 
often even osmocote, which is these little balls of fertilizer that are designed to slowly release and the outer coating is plastic, which then stays in the soil. So get a potting soil with you know, good organic potting soil with compost in it, and that will contain lots of the different beneficial microorganisms that are beneficial to plant life. Put it in the pot um, and then it's very important to press the potting soil down firmly because when you just scoop it in, it tends to be fluffy and it will pit and mound and the seeds will get sucked down into it if you don't press it down. So press it down either with your hand or you can use the bottom of another pot. Then, the, then you will need to make labels. And again, the biodegradable labels like a wooden label, that's great for your vegetable, but it won't last long enough for the native plants. These are all perennials and you will probably need a label in it for a couple of years as you learn to get to know the plant. I like to use a pencil to write on the plastic label because those what are marketed as indelible pens, they don't last forever. They often wash away within a couple months. So a pencil will last on the plastic for a years and you can also erase it and reuse the pencil. Then after we sow the seeds, I'll show you, you cover the seeds with coarse sand. Um, this is available at any good hardware store. It's often called coarse, all-purpose coarse sand and it's sort of textured where the, all the grains aren't the same size unlike Sandbox sand is very fine. This is more textured and you just wanna make sure, especially this time of year when you buy it, that it doesn't have any de-icing salts in it. And if you usually have to buy it in a 40 pound bag. So if you're like, I'll never, I don't need all that sand. It's great for throwing on your walkway. Okay, so we've got the sand to cover the seeds. Then where the seeds are gonna go is outside. And it's really important to cover the flats with wire mesh. Otherwise, cats, squirrels, chipmunks, other rodents will dig in the pot. So you can also just get this wire mesh at a hardware store and the little holes are about a half an inch apart. You don't want chicken wire, those holes are too big. A mouse or chipmunk can go right through that. And then you also need a gentle rain nozzle on whatever method of watering your plant. So one with little dots in it, or if it's a hose, make sure it's got a rain nozzle, not um, something that's designed to wash your car, which would blast the seeds away. So what I'm gonna do now is sh show you how to sow three different species. I picked seeds of different sizes. The first is one of our native milkweeds, the swamp milkweed. And I'm first gonna show you on this white plate because it's easier to see. So I like to pour the seeds out of the packet and put them in my left hand because I'm right-handed. And then I take all the seeds and I sprinkle it around what will be the pot. And I'm just showing you on the plate so you can sort of see. They can be close together. You know, I've got four inch pots here. So they're gonna be about this close together in the pot. So now I'll do it in the actual pot. And native seeds are very different if you're from vegetables or a lot of annual flowers, which grow really quickly and get stunted if they're too close together. That's just not true with the native species. They are really like teenagers and they all are much happier if they're germinating together. Then I take the sand and the milkweed seeds tend to be quite big. They're about you know, more than a quarter of an inch across. They're sort of flat actually. And a good rule of thumb for covering the seeds is to cover them to the depth of the thickness of the seed. So these seeds I'm gonna cover about a quarter of an inch. And again, I just sprinkle it around. And then you put the label in, very important, and push the label way down deep because you're taking this outside. And if you leave it sticking up a couple inches, a squirrel or chipmunk will pull it out and even switch pots with it. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you a very small seed and I'm gonna show you, this is black-eyed coneflower. That might be better up higher. Um, these are very small black, um, seeds, the little green lines. So again, look how closely together I'm 
stirring them all. That's how it will be in the pot. And because these are so dark, I'm going to actually show you in the pots a different small light colored seed. This is our bottled gentian. This is our bottled gentian. I'm going to sprinkle the seeds around. I don't know if that's, I'll, I'll hold this up closely. Um, so these are tiny little seeds. And so small seeds barely get covered. That way. There you go. See how close together they are? So these, because they are less than, they're almost a sixteenth of an inch, it's almost like I'm just putting salt on the on food. Well, this would be heavy salt load, but I just sprinkle it lightly. You barely cover it. And some very small seeds like lobelias, they, they actually don't really get covered at all. So again, the rule of thumb is you cover the seeds to the depth of the thickness of the seed. So a sesame seed would be an eighth of an inch, a sunflower seed would be a quarter of an inch, and a acorn would be an inch deep. Okay, and then the last species I'm gonna show you how to sow are the asters. And because we clean all our seeds by hand, Asters have, are a tiny little seed with a fluffy appendage, and we don't have any equipment that separates those fluffy appendages. So again, they end up, you just sew it all in together. When you're um, sowing the seeds outdoors, all these little, even chaff will just biodegrade. You could, in a greenhouse, if you have a lot of other um, organic matter, you can get a lot of mold, but that does not happen when you're doing outdoor seed sowing. So now I'm going to take those same fluffy seeds and spread them as evenly as I can around. Put the label in that I push the label. Don't leave it sticking up. I'm going to push it way down so that to really read it, you have to pull it up to read it and then cover these seeds. Sand makes a superior covering to the seeds than potting soil. And the reason is a lot of seeds need light um, to germinate. It's why when you till your soil, you bring all these seeds up from deep down, they get the light and, the more, and they germinate. So sand lets a little bit of light through. There, now, I, now I'm not gonna water them now, but I would water them just lightly with, like I said, my, my watering can. You can also, you could also take a pot and stick it in a dish of water and let it absorb water through the bottom. And then you carry them outside, you find a flat piece of ground that's in the shade. And with the ungerminated seedlings, I really like to have people set them up in the shade because it will keep them moist all through the spring as you're waiting to germinate. Then you, so you find a flat piece of ground and then cover them with the wire mesh. And like I said, today would be a perfect day. There's a little dusting of snow on it. I might even scoop some up and sprinkle it on top to protect them a little, but it might go above freezing tomorrow. It might rain tomorrow and then get really cold again. So these native seeds love whatever our New England winter is gonna throw at them. And in fact, they require it to break up the heavy seed coat. These are undomesticated plants. They have a heavy seed coat that needs that freeze and thaw. So the, um, then what you do is just, you know, wait through the winter and be patient and trust that the seed, you know, no matter what the weather does, you get really cold weather and then a warm spell, just these native seeds are adapted to that extremes of weather, weather and will thrive in it. And then the first seeds, you know, when do you look for germination? Well, some species will germinate here in Maine as early as late March, some of the really early ones. Lots of them will germinate in April. And in fact, fact, the rainy, raw, 
cold, damp days, the kind of weather that, you know, uh, organic farmer would hate because they can't get out and plant their tropical or warm weather vegetable seeds. Um, that is ideal germination weather for the native species. Often some of the earliest ones to germinate are the asters and penstemons. And then some of the more warm weather plants like Jack in the Pulpit is one of the last ones to germinate. And it's a, actually most of that plant family is from the tropics. So it's evolved for that. So you put it out and just wait. And then once they start germinating, one of the nice things, so if you look, these are three, four inch pots. I, you know, I really encourage people to, you know, try to sow between, you know, first, even first time people try a variety of different species. So four inch pots, nine pots would take up one square foot of space. And you can potentially have hundreds of seedlings germinating in the spring in one square foot of space. And so then people are always very anxious to get the plant their plants out in the garden right away. But most of the native species are perennials. They're not annual, so they have much slower growth. And um, you know, some species, a milkweed species, can grow a foot or even 18 inches in the first year. Other species will just stay an inch tall that whole first summer. So you can leave them in their pots. Once the pot starts to seem full and crowded or you're noticing it's drying out more regularly, then you can take, what I like to have people do is not divide up the plants, but to take the whole pot, tip, put your hand over the top with the germinated seedlings, tip it upside down and put it in a bigger pot. Um, and let it grow on that way through the summer. So if it was a New England aster or one of the milkweeds, I'd put this a four inch size pot that might have anywhere from 20 to 50 or even a hundred seedlings in it, put in a gallon pot. Um, if it seems to fill that space up quickly, just move it into a bigger pot. Now, if you were a nursery, you would um, end up dividing up those plants over the summer, but that does disturb the roots and it does slow the growth down. And so if you can just move the whole clump into a bigger pot and then wait, and um, from mid-September on is a great time to then divide up the plants and plant them out in your garden. Um, I think that's everything. So I am ready now to take some questions. Um, Thank you so much, Heather, that was fantastic. Um, so how we'll take questions is, um, I started getting some in the chat box. So if you wanna type any other questions in the chat box, I don't suspect we'll get to everybody's questions tonight, but we'll get through a fair few of them. Um, and I'll read them aloud and then Heather can um, answer. So um, a first starting question can be, can you use a window screen um, instead of hardware cloth for um, your screen or is the grid too small? Yes, uh, old window screen would be a great choice and it's already got a frame in it. If you're planting um, eight nuts like acorns, the, you need to actually make a wire cage because the rodents can get through it. But with all these other small seeds, just a wire screen or window, old winter window screen would be a great choice, yes. Great. And what about planting in milk jugs for like a greenhouse effect? Is that um, a good thing to do? Um, I, I, I know plenty of people who have had great success to that are, you know, the, these plants don't need the extra protection of, you know, it kind of makes a winny, win, you know, mini greenhouse. It, so what you really have to be careful is once the seeds germinate, they will germinate earlier because it does have a little greenhouse effect. Um, but you have to make sure you pull the lid off once they germinate. It does have, you know, where I find it works well is with the really small seeds like the lobelias. Now with our heating climate, we are getting such torrential rains. And that's a new problem that's, you know, I'm dealing with where sometimes the rain is so heavy, you know, when it's raining three inches in a couple hours and I can see where actually the milk jug would deflect most of that rain. So I know people who have, who are happily doing it. So I'm all for it if you want to give it a try, but make sure once it germinates 
that it um, you pull the lid off or you'll fry them. And it is what you know I, I mentioned earlier about having the seed plats in the shade till they germinate. When people fail with seed sowing, off, the two biggest reasons are either they buried the seeds too deeply, and particularly if they covered it with dark potting soil, this is where the sand gives you a lot of extra leeway. The sand is also coarse and helps prevent the splashing out in the rain. And then the other way people don't succeed is that the seedlings start to germinate and then they dry out. You know, and by late April, the sun can be really strong. And if you leave the house and go to work somewhere else every day, you can come home and your adorable little seedlings that had just started to germinate had, had fried. So waiting till they've germinated and send some roots down and then the sun living species, you can move into a sunnier spot. Great. And um, yeah, that brings me to another question. Um, a couple of folks asked about if you need to water the pots at any time, and especially, you know, while the seeds are still dormant. Mm -hmm. no, so I, I usually, unless it's snowing or raining, when I'm carrying the pots outside, I water them before I put them outside. So for instance, these New England asters that are a little bit fluffy or the teeny seeds, if they're dry and you took them outside in the winter and it was windy, you know, they could blow around. So that's where if you just water them a little bit, but no, you never have to. Okay, I shouldn't say never with the way our world is, but no, I never have to start watering until April sometime. So that's the beauty of the fall and winter seed sowing. The soil stays moist. The seeds are really high, well hydrated. In fact, something like New England asters, the aster seeds actually don't have to, don't require winter cold period. You can sow them outdoors in the spring, but the ones that you sow out in the fall and winter will germinate much earlier than the ones you sow in April. So this pot I just sowed it here, this will be one of the early ones to germinate. Um, if I sowed some more in early April, those will germinate weeks later. So these will get a head start. And it's just the seeds are so well hydrated from the long, cold, raw winter. And they won't mold. You know, people always are worried, are the native seeds going to rot? But no, that's, that's domesticated plant. You know, so many of our crop plants and our annual flowers, those are from a tropical country. So when it's cold, raw weather, they, they do get stressed and can rot. But that won't happen with the native seeds. Um, yeah, and so that makes me wonder, um, can you overwater your little seedlings in spring? Yes, watering is probably one of the hardest chores. You can overwater, which again, when they're young, having them in part shade so they're not drying out so fast. You know, um, so it's better to wait and water when you see it needs it, um, especially in sort of April and early May. Um, you know, the only time I I don't water every day if it doesn't need it at that time of year, but if you're not keeping your eye on it, let's say you were going away for the weekend and it was early May, I'd water everything well before I went. So, you know, you can overwater, you can water heavily for a couple of days, but if you do it weeks on end, the more dry loving species like um, black eyed coneflower would not be happy being overwatered, but swamp milkweed would love it. Awesome. And um, what do, we do about underneath the pots. Do you put anything under them? Um, you know, if I was going to put, so some, sometimes I put them on my brick paving. Sometimes I put, if you get extra wire mesh, you can put that underneath it too. I've used a board sometimes, but I've also put them directly on the ground. But, you know, if for some reason you had a lot of voles, you know, the, the voles are more not after seeds, they're off after roots. So these don't have the roots till the spring. So it wouldn't hurt to put something flat like this underneath it too, or another screen. Actually, if you've got a lot of old window screens, yes, they could be repurposed for native seed propagation. Great. Um, and then I have another question about just clarifying how many seeds do you need to plant per pot? Is it maybe a whole seed packet or do you split that up? Uh, yes, I, I sow seeds really thickly. You will, people, you will see 
I will have, you know, sometimes 200 seedlings in a little pot like this. So yes, in general, I recommend sowing our whole, um, our whole package of seeds in the pot. You could split it in two, but you can, you can just move it up later. And they, they don't mind germinating close together. I think they almost prefer it. But, it, but if they are starting to look crowded, then you move that whole flat into a bigger pot. Or if you really felt like, uh, you know, there's more than a hundred seedlings in here, you could, you know, when you divide, when you're ready to move it to a bigger part, you could do it in four sections, but not divide each one up individually. That will waste, that will set it back for a couple of weeks. Um, and then one person has bought some uh, seeds from Prairie Moon Nursery, which is a fantastic nursery in the Midwest. And they're wondering if they need to follow um, the specific germination code instructions or whether they can put their seeds um, in pots now uh, as we advise at Wild Seed Project. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, one of the reasons to do all your sowing now is it does, one of the things that you know, has made people confused about native seed sowing is, you know, there's some species that only need a month of wind, 30 days, some need 60 days, some need 90 days, some need 120 days. So all that information, you know, this gets confusing to people. So no, you can just sow them outdoors now um, with them too. You know, you might've gotten some seeds from them that are moist stratified, they should be sown right away. So you, there are some species that they need, um, the embryos immature when the seed ripens and they actually need a warm period, then a cold period, then a warm period to germinate. So in that case, you could just wait and sow them next summer instead of doing it now. But no, that's the beauty of this fall and winter seed sowing is you can just do all of it now. This is what they would get in nature, obviously. And um, what about flowers that do bloom the first year, like black-eyed Susan or spotted bee balm? Do you, when do you divide those and plant them? Okay, so that's a great question because there are some exceptions to growing them on in pots for the summer. Black-eyed coneflower will bloom. You know, it's a rare native perennial that will bloom the first year within a couple months of you sowing it. So you can right away divide them up and start planting them out. Um, Spotted bee balm won't sometimes will bloom the first year, sometimes not till the second year. Spotted bee balm is a real dry land plant, and some of our plants from really dry soil areas really hate plastic pots. So that's one that grows really well in clay pots, or you could plant out in the in your landscape sooner. It's just, if you go plant, you know, by the time these are big enough to plant in the, your garden, it's already June. And it's pretty hard to take a juvenile plant, put it in your garden and keep, your, keep it watered, you know, checking on it a couple of times a week when everything else is growing all over the place. So um, something like spotted bee balm, I tend to just take that pot of seedlings and put it in a much bigger pot, but black eyed coneflower, is one that you can plant in the landscape that first year. Same with the sundial lupin. That one doesn't transplant very easily. So I tend to just sow a couple of those seeds in each pot and then put them in their permanent location um, in the summer. So there are a few exceptions. Yeah. Um, okay, great. I think we're um, out of time for questions, um, but that was a, a really great group of questions. and. There will be um, another seed sowing tutorial on January 12th. It's a more of a lunchtime tutorial. We were experimenting with a few different times of day to just see who can make it. Um, but you're welcome to sign up for another one if you'd like another overview and another time for Q&A. Also, I encourage everyone, if you're not a member of Wild Seed Project, to become a member because that's, you know, you're supporting a fantastic nonprofit and also the work that we do. And then you have a benefit of being able to join our monthly hour long Q and A sessions that where we really can just go into the nitty gritty of growing native plants from seed and growing native plants out in your landscape. Um, and you get to basically chat with Heather and I 
and sometimes an expert that might join us. Um, and so it's just a really great community experience for our members too. Um, and I just encourage everyone to check out um, our website because it has a lots of great resources on um, growing native uh, seeds. And I just added a few to the chat if you wanna check that out now. Um, I'll be sending out a follow-up email with um, the YouTube recording that you can watch um, to, to go through things again and some of those resources. So please stay tuned for that. And thank you everyone so much for joining us today. Um, I hope we can see your faces again. Bye-bye. So nobody, you can't see anybody's face.